Hello, uh, this is Daisy Jackson. I'd like to welcome you to the Advisor Live. Um, we are excited today to have two really great speakers, Dr. Michael Ryback and Stacey Whitcomb. Um, just to go through some quick logistics, I think we have a lot of people on the line today. I do want to let you know this webinar is being recorded and that you'll be able to view it later on the PremierInc.com events page. Um, that is our Advisor Live homepage. Um, so today our presentation is called um, Vancomycin from Trough to uh, Dosing. Vancomycin Dosing from Trough to AUC. Uh, as I mentioned, our two speakers today are Dr. Michael J. Ryback and Stacy Whitcomb. I will be introducing them in just a second. I want to let you know we will be leaving questions for the end. Um, so if you have any questions, you are welcome to put those into the chat window, uh, and I will read them out at the end of the uh, presentation. Or you may pick up the line and speak to the operator um, at the end and, and put your question in that way. So with that, I would like to introduce our two speakers. So Dr. Ryback is a professor of pharmacy with the Department of Pharmacy Practice, adjunct professor of pharmaceutical sciences, and director of the Anti-Infective Research Laboratory of the Eugene Applebaum College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences at Wayne State University. He is also adjunct professor of medicine, division of infectious diseases, school of medicine, Wayne State University, and adjunct clinical professor of pharmacy, College of Pharmacy at the University of Michigan. Dr. Ryback's research focus is antimicrobial pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, and the assessment of infectious diseases health outcomes, including their relationship to bacterial resistance. His most recent work is focused on the use of combination therapy, including the use of bacterial phages plus antibiotics to prevent resistance. Dr. Ryback is funded by the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases via, and via several investigator-initiated grants from the pharmaceutical industry. He has published more than 390 manuscripts and authored 20 book chapters on antimicrobial PK and PD resistance and antimicrobial stewardship. He is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Infectious Diseases and Therapy and a scientific editor for Infectious Diseases for Pharmacotherapy, editorial board member for Critical Reviews in Microbiology, and also for Contagion. He is also a reviewer for several leading publications, including Clinical Infectious Diseases, Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy, the Journal of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy, Open Forum Infectious Diseases, and Lancet ID. Dr. Ryback has served on the guideline committees for MRSA infections for the IDSA, infective endocarditis for AHA, and is the chair of the Vancomycin Consensus Guidelines Committee representing ASHP, IDSA, PIDS, and SIDP. So we are very grateful to have this expert here with us today to talk to us about these changes in vancomycin dosing. Um, our other speaker is Stacy Whitcomb, and Stacy received her Bachelor's of Science at the North Dakota State University in Medical Technology, and she has over 18 years of clinical experience starting her career as a clinical microbiologist and later as a certified infection preventionist in a large multi-entity health organization in the Minneapolis, Minnesota area. Over the last six plus years, Stacy has served as a senior clinical consultant for the Theradoc product at Premier, providing training and consulting to both pharmacists and infection preventionists across the country. She is now in a role as the, her current role as the product director for the Theradoc product at Premier, and will be talking with us about how Premier is addressing this change to the dosing guidelines. So with that, um, I am going to advance the slide. Uh, and turn the presentation over to you, Dr. Ryback. Okay, thank you, Daisy. Um, hopefully I have the controls here um, to move on. But I want to thank everybody for joining us uh, this afternoon to talk about vancomycin dosing and the whole transition from trough monitoring to area underneath the curb or concentration curve. And with that, I'll get started. So the objectives for today's lecture describe the data and the controversies associated with current vanco dosing and monitoring. We're going to talk about the updates and the changes that are coming in the consensus guidelines, and then we'll discuss some alternative approaches for dosing and monitoring vanco therapy. These are my disclosures. So let's start with why are we doing this? So 
the vancomycin guidelines are being revised um, because of a, for a number of different reasons, one of which is to uh, reevaluate the, the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic targets for vancomycin uh, to reassess um, the monitoring of TROF versus AUCs, uh, to revisit vancomycin susceptibility issues because, as you know, that plays a big role in how we dose or how aggressively we dose vancomycin. This time around, we want to include pediatric recommendations uh, for dosing and monitoring, uh, spend a little more time on uh, body weight and dosage adjustment there, specifically obesity and revisiting loading dose recommendations. We took a look at intermittent versus continuous infusion administration of vancomycin. We have new recommendations for renal failure, including specific dialysis recommendations. And then we wanted to revisit the growing concerns regarding renal toxicity secondary to vancomycin exposure. And then finally, to uh, have revised uh, monitoring recommendations. So we're going to start with a little bit of the comparative PK and PD for vancomycin just to uh, revisit that issue. On the slide here, we have four different glycopeptides. We're just going to concentrate on vancomycin. And these are free concentrations, but a typical dose of about a gram Q12 of vancomycin, which is roughly 15 milligrams per kilogram um, for about an 80 uh, kilogram person, uh, would get a free concentration of about 21.5 at the end of the infusion. Uh, the AUC 24 hour would be approximately 100, so 98.4. Uh, the half-life for vancomycin ranges from about 6 to 12 hours or so. Most people you'll find in the literature will list it as 6. It's about 50% protein bound to major proteins, including albumin. It's renally eliminated, so therefore we have to make adjustments to vancomycin. And the PKPD target uh, has been and still will remain is the area underneath the curve divided by the minimal inhibitory concentration. So when we go back and just look at a few pieces of data as to how we came up with the AUC to MIC being the primary um, pharmacokinetic dynamic um, predictor of success with vancomycin, a lot of it comes from animal work such as this. This is a typical mouse thigh model that's used to determine which parameter best fits the antibiotic. And each of those dots represent a different mouse. And on the bottom of the x-axis is we're looking at different exposures. So in the first panel, we're looking at different AUCs divided by MICs, and they range from 30 to up to 1,000. In the second panel, we're looking specifically at mice that were dosed to achieve a certain peak level above the MIC. You can see that range from 10 to 1,000. And then finally, vancomycin was dosed in those animals specifically to maintain time above the MIC for a certain percentage, and that percentage ranged from anywhere from 0 to 100%. And I made it quite easy for you in the first panel here. We're looking for a change in the number of organisms at the site of infection, in this case, the mouse thigh. And zero is the line of stasis. So once we cross that line of stasis, we're actually killing organisms. We're looking here for the best fit. And I drew a line through the, um, the dots, if you will, the mice, for the 24-hour AUC that might say. You can see that's the best fitting data that we have. If we do a line through peak to MIC, there's somewhat of a fit there, but uh, certainly no fit from time greater than MIC. So for our um, results here, it's really AUC divided by um, MIC. <clears throat> and this is further data from the same model here, looking at what exposures are actually required. So before we're looking at um, different ranges here, but here we're looking at exactly the exposures that makes a difference. And on the right-hand side, for banco susceptible Staph aureus, it ranges from 156, 157 to 263 in free concentrations, but that's it, upwards of 400 to 500 when we we'll start looking at uh, total concentrations. This is some human data that's very old, actually. It comes from um, uh, the beginning of 2000 or so was published. But it's looking at um, eradication rates of staph from uh, patients who have pneumonia and looking at those eradication rates as it relates to different 
area underneath the curve divided by the MICs. And what these investigators found, that they had the highest success rates, the highest odds for success, when the AUC to MIC was greater than or equal to 350, and that was uh, further rounded up to 400. And so that's partly where that data comes from as well. In humans, besides animals of a target around 400 to 500 or so, is based on these types of relationships, eradication rates or uh, at the infection site, for example, staphylococcus site, whether it's in animals or in humans. So what about the vancomycin MIC? Because I said that was a, one of the things we wanted to revisit. And you can see here in the drawing that MIC in red is a very important part of the equation. So why is it important? Because if the MIC, uh, we're, here we're looking at the percent of, of the percent of the, uh, your ability to maintain um, an AUC to MIC ratio of 400. And so we're looking at percentages here. So if the MIC is 0.5, we can look at that first arrow, and you have a 100% chance of getting that target of 400 uh, of an AUC to MIC ratio with conventional dosing of vancomycin. Conventional, what does that mean? Like a gram Q12 would be conventional dose or so, or even 500 milligrams Q12 would be reasonable to maintain that target. But once you start moving that MIC up, you can see now you start to lose a little bit at one, not that much, but we start to lose some. But as you get up to two, you can see now we have to move the dose up way up. In fact, four grams a day, two grams Q12, and we're only going to be able to hit 50% of our patients will get that target. And the other 50% we're gonna be either below or, or above. So we're not gonna be able to hit that target. So it becomes more difficult. And, and, we're, and by the way, we're gonna be less likely to hit that target than more likely. So it becomes more difficult as the MIC goes up beyond one. And that's why the MIC is so important to all of these equations. So we move on to susceptibility testing. So one of the problems we have is the susceptibility testing that comes from the clinical microbiology laboratory. And so there's always been this concern that maybe the MIC is creeping up the vancomycin. You know, the drug's been around for 61 years. And so by now you would expect that there are some non-susceptible strains, right? Well, there are regional differences if you dive into the literature. So you can find some outbreaks where there are MICs high of two. Um, there are clonal outbreaks. That means that the patient's isolate that has an MIC of two is being passed from one patient to another. So it's not that all the isolates are two, it's just that we have a lot of the same. Um, uh, and an infection control problem. There's even been reverse creep um, been reported in the pediatric literature where over a five-year period they had a lot of MICs of two and then all of a sudden they didn't see them. Well, most of the problem is really the susceptibility testing method itself. Now, the methods that are out there that are automated are Vitec 2. You might have that at your hospital. Microscan, we used to have that at our hospital or Phoenix, we have that now at the Detroit Medical Center, or maybe somebody does an e-test. And the problem is, is that they all have different results. So in fact, there was a publication that we did in 2013 if we sent out 200 isolates, that which we knew what the MIC was by standard methodologies, and we found some discrepancies. Microscan overcalled MICs of two by as much as 75%. Phoenix undercalled by as much as 74%. Vitec 2 was 20 to 30 percent off, and E-Test almost always overcalled the MIC, uh, but that was somewhat explainable because the inoculum, the size of the organism you put on the plate, is much higher than traditional testing uh, by microbroth dilution. So the bottom line is that we do get a high variance in MIC back uh, from the laboratory, and it makes a big difference in how we're going to dose vancomycin. Here's a, a paper that was a meta-analysis that looked at nearly 30,000 strains from 55 different studies. And when you look at the pool mean, and most of it was done by hand, by broth microdilution, which is traditional standard, or by e-test or auger methods or automated methods, but at the end of the day, most of the MICs were one, if you look at the pool mean here. And in this 55 studies, um, <clears throat> they found no evidence of an MIC creep uh, phenomena. If we look a little bit further, 
on the next slide, this is a recent study that's come out earlier this year from JMI Laboratories, part of a century surveillance data worldwide. And here I put a red box around the MIC of one. You can see for MRSA, they examined 57,000 strains and found that no, more than 95% of the strains had an MIC of one. So what is that telling us? That's saying that most of the time uh, we, can, we can bet that the MIC for vancomycin is pretty much one. Yes, there's going to be a few twos out there. There could be some point fives, but for the most part, reliably, the MIC uh, is going to be one. And that's gonna, we'll come back to that because that makes a big difference in how we uh, calculate our AUC to MIC. So about 10 years ago, it's, it's a, believe it or not, it's been 10 years since the last consensus guidelines for vancomycin came out, um, we had some recommendations. And let's, we, back then we talked about the PKPT target being AUC to MIC. We said it was, we should target around 400. And for the various serious infections like bacteremia, pneumonia, meningitis, endocarditis, and osteomyelitis. And even though we knew the AUC to MIC was the primary target, we tried to make it easy for everyone by targeting troughs. There would be less samples that would be drawn, and mathematically, with patients with normal renal function, if you're in the area of 15 to 20, uh, most patients we thought would be getting a AUC to MIC, around 400 if the MIC was one. Uh, we also noted back then that having trust below 10 probably wasn't good a good idea because it encouraged the development of resistance to vancomycin. So that was then. We also talked about dosing. The typical dose is 15 milligrams per kilogram every 8 to 12 hours. We said use actual body weight, load patients that are really ill, the ICU patients predominantly. <clears throat> Troughs, get them off the third or fourth dose. Excuse me, and then just as necessary to get that targeted trough area because we're, that targeted trough was obviously related to the AUC that we actually wanted to get. Well, the relationship since that time, the relationship between troughs and outcomes in MRSA invasive in infection hasn't, well, hasn't been well defined. In fact, there are not many studies that show that, you know, maintaining those troughs at those levels really improve, necessarily improve patient outcomes. There's a couple of studies that have shown a little bit of better result. As you can see on the slide, a lower failure rate of 40% versus 61%. Um, but the real problem that we were, and when reviewing the literature, was that there was a, a growing number of studies that have documented increased rates of kidney injury when aggressively uh, targeting troughs that were greater than 15 if you look at the next slide, this has to do, uh, this is a slide from Tom Rodice, and this is a study that uh, he conducted some time ago, but looking at uh, probability of nephrotoxicity. In this case, the y-axis is the probability of remaining non-nephrotoxic. And so if you're up towards the top, you're not nephrotoxic. And in this study, he compared vancomycin standard dosing to high dosing versus linazolin, which is not known to have any kidney problems. And what you can see by this Kaplan-Meier analysis, as you go out to the right, days after initiating therapy, the higher the dose, the faster you become nephrotoxic. So especially if you get into the area of around four grams per day. So that's going to be important to us in terms of our maximum recommendations uh, for vancomycin. Now, if you look at some meta-analysis that uh, lots of studies that have looked at maintaining 15 to 20 milligrams per liter for a trough, and the relationship to nephrotoxicity, this is a forest plot of all of those data uh, that you see on the right-hand side. So anything to the right of one indicates there is a strong relationship between troughs that are maintained greater than 15 milligrams per liter and nephrotoxicity. So you can see that all of them, all of those studies pretty much are reporting the same thing. The actual overall odds ratio for all the studies is 2.76, so nearly three times higher odds ratio of nephrotoxicity occurring if you maintain troughs greater than 15 to 20. Uh, this is some data from the Detroit Medical Center, and uh, we collected, it's not published, but we collected it in 2015. We wanted to see how we were doing with dosing patients to achieve that target of 15 to 20. 
So I have kind of a bullseye there. You look in the middle where that red dot is. That is actually the uh, mean, mean uh, these are, uh, I should tell you, this is 472 samples from 227 patients. And the red dot in the middle is our mean uh, trough concentration. So uh, that's 18.25. And that's obviously trying to go from 15 to 20. But what you should notice is the, is the variability. It's all over the place, kind of like a target practice with a, a shooting target. Uh, you can find out that the, most of the time we couldn't hit that mark if we wanted to, like you're trying to hit the broad side of a barn. Uh, our ranges for these patients were, even though we're trying to get 15 to 20, was 4.7 to 64.8. Not very good. So our ability to even hit that trough level using a single trough to, to get that target level uh, was very poor. That's, that's the point of the slide. Now, remember, we made, the, we made the relationship that 15 to 20 would be similar to an AUC of about 400. But this is a subsequent study that was done by Amit Pai and uh, Mike Neely, Keith Radville, Tom Modif, and they were looking at the relationship for those bank trough concentrations and how much they are actually associated with the target. And so I've sort of drawn in these goal posts, and you can see where 400, that line goes across from left to right. That's the 400 AUC that we're trying to achieve. And what you should notice is that most of the time we're, over, we're achieving way over that when we're targeting troughs 50 to 20. You can see it's well above that, and some of them it goes into over 1,200. Uh, so that's a bad sign. So we're not seeing a lot of variability below 400. We're seeing that 15 to 20 usually gets 400 and then some above that uh, concentration or exposure. So data supports the AUC to MIC ratio of 400. We talked about some of the mouse data, some of the limited human data that support us eradicating infections uh, when we get maintain that. Um, one of the problems with examining AUC to MIC ratios in the past, and we, as we look through the literature, is that individuals that were studying it were just using simple formulas. They were taking the dose that patients received in 24 hours and dividing it by the clearance, which was um, derived from creatinine clearance, which, as you know, is not a great estimate sometimes of patients' renal function. And because of that, they were often underestimating what the actual AUC was. So if individuals were to use this type of data, uh, most likely they'd underestimate what the actual AUC was, even though they would report there was a relationship or there wasn't a relationship with outcome uh, with those AUC values. And that's because of the variability in creatinine clearance. And so to, to make that point, um, if you use that simple formula approach, you can see the relationship between observed concentrations and predicted on the right-hand side. It's not that great. Um, we're going to talk a little bit later about map Bayesian approach, which is much more precise for achieving the targeted goals. Now, there's been a number of studies that have used uh, either two methods out there since since the formula-based method that I told you that wasn't very good. Um, and so across here are just some of those studies. There's three prospective observational or randomized studies here. One's randomized, two are observational. And there's one retrospective quasi-experiment. And they either use the Bayesian approach, which we're going to talk about, or they use the trapezoidal two-level approach, which is what we do at Detroit Medical Center. We get two levels post-infusion and we figure out an actual AEC using a trapezoid method. And using those methods, they've been able to show some relationships to outcomes uh, relating to AEC, but mostly a lot of these studies have shown um, that there's a relationship with uh, a certain level of AUC and toxicity. And we're going to talk more about that. This is one of the most recent uh, studies that was published in 2019 uh, by Tom Ladis. It's a prospective observational study um, that was look, looked at day two of vancomycin exposure, and he looked at failure rates uh, in patients specifically had MRSA bloodstream infections. The study design was a prospective multicenter. It was funded by the NIH, and these were adult patients who had bloodstream infections with MRSA, and Tom used the Bayesian method to estimate the vancomycin exposures. And he was evaluating uh, whether or not the exposures were greater than 650 or, or by broth microdilution, greater than equal to 650, or 
320 by e-test. Now, why would there be a difference between uh, these two? 320, excuse me, 320 and uh, 650. Well, e-test usually has a value, as I mentioned, that's higher than the MIC for broth microdilution. So that means because it's the um, it's a ratio of AC to MIC, uh, you'll get a much lower exposure. So they're actually equal. It depends on what MIC you're putting in the bottom. The outcomes that were evaluated uh, were treatment failure at 30-day mortality or if the patient's bacteremia exceeded seven days and secondarily looked at acute kidney injury. Now, Tom did something different here. He actually used a, a global outcome so to look at how patients did. And the global outcome that I'm going to show you is that the patient, a positive global outcome would be that the patient had uh, no renal dysfunction and they didn't fail therapy. So let's go on and look at that. So this is something, this is part of the study, it's something called a, a door analysis. And here we're looking at that global outcome. So in the purple, so I, I should tell you what we're looking at first. So we're looking at different quartiles of AUCs. So all these patients obviously had different AUC values depending upon what dose of vancomycin they uh, received and how large they were and what their renal function was. And those exposures ranged anywhere from as little as 94 up to 1755. And so then what this analysis does, it, it starts to group those patients into these quartiles. And in the purple boxes is the best outcome. It's the positive global outcome. So these patients survived their infection, they had uh, treatment success, and they didn't have renal dysfunction. Now, in the different colors, the brown, for example, means they survived uh, with treatment success, but they did have kidney injury. And then there's also they survived in the red with treatment failure, and they had um, renal dysfunction. And lastly, in the blue, uh, they didn't survive. <clears throat> so what we're looking for here is the best relationship, and you'll have to read the study, but uh, the second quartile ended up being the best relationship, and that was AUC to MICs that ranged from 400 to 515 gave the best global outcome. Again, more evidence that uh, patients with AUC to MICs in that 400 to 500 range uh, did fairly well. This is a study here um, that was done at Detroit Medical Center by Natalie Finch and published in 2017. And we were looking here at vancomycin-guided uh, dosing and the relationship between nephrotoxicity. And remember, we switched over in 2015 to AUC-guided dosing. So this is a single-center retrospective quasi-experiment. Uh, we evaluated patients before and after, so those that got trough monitoring and those that got AUC monitoring. And we did it by the trapezoidal method, as I mentioned before. We also did a map Bayesian approach. And why, why did we do that? Because that was the only way we could calculate what the trough uh, would have got for an AUC. Because with one single level, you can't do that unless you apply a Bayesian approach to determining what their AUC exposure would have been. And so we ended up looking at uh, patients that are fairly severe. They had lots of comorbid conditions, and we controlled for con concomitant nephrotoxins and their severity of illness. And we ended up with nearly 1,300 patients. You see they're 1,280, 546 trough, 734 AUC guided. And what we found that AUC guided dosing was independently associated with lower nephrotoxicity, so actually a protection if you went with AUC dosing versus if you stuck with the trough uh, guided dosing. And we were able to show uh, by looking at the Bayesian estimates there that the AUCs for the, the trough uh, were always higher than the AC guided methods that we're using at the DMC. You can see there that zero to 24 hour AC was 705, but doing it by two levels, it was 474, much safer. 663 when we look at 24 to 48, but if you did it by the AUC guided two level monitoring, it was 532. So again, much better. And this is. Um, um, looking at a Kaplan-Meier, actually a Cox proportional hazard model. And again, at the top is no nephrotoxicity, uh, and at the bottom is days, and what you can see that it drops off a lot faster, getting more nephrotoxicity over time with trough monitoring compared to AEC monitoring. And again, the red arrow is showing us that the hazard ratio is 0.5, so it's less than one. It means it's protective if you're using AEC dosing 
as opposed to trough level monitoring. This is a study by uh, Evan Zazowski, who worked in our laboratory as a postdoc, and um, we were examining um, what is the threshold for nephrotoxicity. So how high can you go uh, in the AUC before you actually start to get a lot of nephrotoxicity? And so I won't go through the entire study, but we're looking at the percent of nephrotoxicity on the y-axis, and at the bottom we're looking at different exposures. And overall, uh, what we found is about 700 is the limit. So once you get up to 700 as an AUC and exceed that, your nephrotoxicity rate starts to climb uh, considerably. So now we know, at least for adult patients, that 700 would probably be the area that we, uh, above 700 would probably be the area that we want to avoid. We also looked at trough levels too, and that had a much higher nephrotoxic rate compared to AUC monitoring. Now, the similar type studies have been done in pediatrics, and this is a study by um, Jennifer Lee, and they found that the AUC, the, MI, the AUC threshold was 800. So in adults, it was 700, and in uh, pediatrics, it was 800. They also found a higher relationship with using trough monitoring and nephrotoxicity as well in this study. And this was um, 680 patients that had uh, 1,500 serum concentrations of vancomycin. Oops. So the preliminary recommendations for our consensus guidelines that are coming out soon, hopefully published before the end of the year, uh, the recommendations are going to be for staph aureus infections only. Why would that be? Because we only have staph aureus infection data. Uh, we don't have it for other pathogens right now. Uh, AUC guided dosing approach will be preferred. Bayesian approach, if you can use it, uh, that's the most precise. If you cannot, um, and the Bayesian approach, the most precise would be two post-dose samples, but you can get away with just a single trough if you are using Bayesian. Or the, like we do right now at the Detroit Medical Center, we're using two post-dose levels. Um, the target will be 400 to 600. We're trying to stay away from that 700 and trying to be at least 400. It will be for serious infections. We're going to assume for empiric dosing the MIC is 1 because that's what the data tells us. And we're going to try to get that AUC in that range in the first 24 to 48 hours. So let's talk a little bit about this. First things first, it says, is this for everyone, excluding considerations, exclusion considerations? Well, the AUC-based dosing um, will increase uh, resource utilization because you will get two levels unless you have Bayesian and, and end up doing a single level. Um, right now, the guidelines don't really cover skin and soft tissue infections because there's no data there yet uh, as to uh, what we would use for an AUC. Um, we might recommend I, one possibility, the guidelines don't recommend this, but one possibility is, is, is to use flat dosing um, and, you know, give everybody a gram Q12 or or 1250Q12 or something for skin and soft tissue infections and not necessarily be aggressive on AUC dosing. We just don't have the data yet. Uh, the reason why we say that for skin and soft tissue infections, when you look at clinical trials, the most common dose of vancomycin is about a gram Q12, and it's usually equal and efficacious to whatever the agent is they're comparing it to, whether it's daptomycin, linazolid, septarylene, uh, any of the new agents that have been compared to a vancomycin. Uh, renal insufficiency, oh, oh, for urinary tract infection, you probably don't really need Banco. You probably know that. Renal insufficiency, um, uh, maybe a acute kidney, maybe end-stage renal disease. I mean, you may, if the patient's uh, renal function is unstable, uh, uh, I, I still think you should get AEC dosing, but you, you may want to go level by level in some of those patients. I think the guidelines do address that. So what about the mass? Um, most of you already do this, um, especially if you're using aminoglycosides, getting a peak and trough. And by the way, vancomycin for about 35 or 40 years was dosed with a peak and trough. So you're used to these formulas. There's nothing magic about them. Uh, this is a formula to get your C-max and your C-min, and you've seen this before. Any pharmacokinetic textbook would have these formulas. So nothing new there. The second part's nothing new either, except for just addition of calculating the AUC. And you can see that uh, there's a two-step process for that. You've got to calculate the AUC during the infusion time, and then you've got to calculate the AUC during the elim elimination time. 
and then you just add those two together uh, to get your AUC for 24 hours. So it's just a simple addition, um, again, uh, process. And this is a visual of the same thing. You're going to calculate the AUC uh, during the infusion period and then during the elimination period and just add those two together. So simple math. Uh, your current practice is that you get a trough at steady state and you hope that it's really a trough because sometimes they're not drawn as a trough and then you proportionally modify the dose. That's what I was showing you before, what the Detroit Medical Center used to do, but it's all over the board. We're anywhere from getting a trough of four to 64 in, in our data. Um, switching to AEC is actually more uh, accurate um, as you get multiple samples to calculate the AEC, and there's certainly more wiggle room uh, with the dose uh, when levels are obtained versus just getting a single level. It certainly seems like a lot of math. Again, we're used to that math because we do it all the time. Um, there are various strategies to mitigate the workflow. Uh, our program is an Excel-based uh, homegrown program that we created for us. It's on our intranet, and we just go to it and get our calculations done. I'll show it to you in a second. Some people have been able to build it into their EMR. I know the University of Maryland has done that. Uh, there's the Bayesian approach, and that can be uh, very automated as well. And there's various online calculators. Uh, uh, and I'm just making a point here. Make sure that you know uh, what's going into them, because garbage in, garbage out. Uh, you got to know what's behind the doors, uh, who created these uh, calculators, and where are the, what information are they using to create those. This is a snapshot of Detroit Medical Center's um, homegrown program, in which we are using two post-dose levels. Uh, it's an Excel sheet. Uh, the yellow parts are what the pharmacist uh, fills in typically, and the rest of it's calculated. So you can dial in your dose, uh, what you want to give, and it'll give you a predicted uh, AEC. Um, you can make changes with the creatinine. You, you, know, you can make changes on patient's height and weight. Um, same thing you've been doing right along for dosing, uh, except that this is automated. Once you get levels, you just have to put the timing in of the levels, um, when they were drawn, what the concentrations were back from the lab. It's going to calculate a new, um, it's going to calculate the clearance, it's going to calculate your new volume distribution, and give you a steady state AEC calculation. Of course, uh, you can manipulate that. Uh, you can, if you want to modify that, you can go back and make changes, and whatever dose and interval you put in, it'll tell you what your new predicted uh, AUC will be, and it's based on the patient's actual parameters that were derived from those levels. So again, this is a Excel sheet based uh, calculator. Now what about the Bayesian approach? Bayesian um, is based on what's called the Bayes theorem. It's basically a statistical theorem um, that stipulates that one can describe the probability of an event based on prior knowledge or conditions that might be related to the event. So what we have in the bottom there is that we need to come up with an empiric dose. It's not that dissimilar to what you're currently doing because you're using uh, some kind of population model in which you have a creatinine clearance, a KE that you derive from some population, whether it's your population or someone else's, and you have a prior volume distribution, so you have clearance and volume distribution um, that you're going to use to help you calculate uh, what the patient's exposures will be for vancomycin. That's the prior model. And then once you get levels back, um, then it's going to be modified, not that dissimilar to what you're doing now. So you get levels back and then you modify your dose. But what the Bayesian does, it actually, um, it actually revises the calculation. It, it refines it. It sort of learns from the patient's concentrations and from the data that you're providing and comes up with a, a better estimate of what the AUC might be. So it's a, a, the ability to make revisions uh, from that data. And it can take sparse data as opposed to several different levels and uh, still make uh, pretty good predictions of what the patient's uh, exposures might be. By the way, ba uh, Bayesian type approaches are used in weather forecasting. They're used in casinos to decide how many uh, tables they need in a certain room to make a certain profit. So it's, uh, it's been used for many, many years. Uh, in this case, we're using it mathematically to help us predict 
uh, patients' exposures. Uh, so the advantages of, uh, here's the pros and cons. So the advantages of Bayesian based methods versus traditional is that it can be modified to include select pharmacokinetic models. So you can modify it to be a pediatric model, be a, a model that's based on uh, obese patients, uh, a general population model. So you can sort of select the model that you want. Uh, potentially requires only one concentration. As I mentioned, it, it is powerful enough that it can actually use one concentration with good uh, data that you provide to predict to, with uh, good precision uh, what the AEC might be. Um, it's not limited to trough values, so you can samples don't necessarily have to be taken at steady state. You can sort of take them at any time as long as you know the time it was drawn. And it, as I mentioned, it's an adaptive program, so it learns as it goes. The major downfall is capital expenditure for some people, um, depending upon if you're going to purchase it or if you're going to use a program that's provided uh, free. Um, there's also, under, there's a good, you need to understand the prior. So where the prior population comes from is important because you want to know if that matches your patient population or how well does it match your patient population. These are some uh, considerations about Bayesian. So there's some studies here looking at the ability to uh, hit a target. Uh, up at the top is um, a Bayesian estimate. Uh, using uh, multiple samples, for example, uh, getting an AEC of about 250. Uh, if you use the Bayesian approach only with just one level, you see that it you know, derives an AEC of about 259. So remember, 250 is the reference. So using one trough level, it gets 259. If you use a peak and trough, it gets 239. If you use a uh, peak and trough, it gets 247, for example. Uh, so it just tells you the more you know, how precise it is based on how much data you actually feed it, but it is possible to get away with one level. Um, on the bottom is a, is a number of programs that are out there, um, Bayesian pro programs, and this is sort of showing their uh, precision uh, for getting AUC. So you could take a look at those references if you like, um, but there's programs like a APK, Best Dose, Dose Me, Insight Rx, Precision PK, and there's another equation-based uh, formulas as well. And that, by the way, there's a publication there I would recommend that you take a look at to review from pharmacotherapy on those various methods. Um, this is, happens to be Insight RX, uh, shows the program um, uh, for empiric dosing, um, and you can see that uh, Insight RX is lo looking at a dose of a gram, for example, every eight hours. It's predicting what the AEC is. It's predicting what the trough levels are going to be. And it's actually giving you a percent. Uh, if you go with that particular concentration, what's the likelihood of toxicity? Uh, you know, 19% in that case. And at the bottom, it gives you a visual showing what your uh, exposure levels will look like at steady state concentration. Uh, here's another look at a Bayesian program adjustment more clearly. You can see what your previous dose was, and that's giving you suggested dosing here. So you pick what you like um, based on the, your particular patient and exposure. Again, it's going to give you the different AUC values that you can go with um, if you want to be in that 400 to 600, for example, range. Uh, and you can look at the far right. You can look at what the toxicity percentages are. Uh, obviously, the 1,097 has a 56% chance, chance of causing nephrotoxicity compared to the 378 or 557, for example, in terms of toxicity rates. This is, again, the software that's out there. You can take a look at that pharmacotherapy publication um, to get more ideas on that. Uh, when to get levels, um, again, first dose versus steady state. And one of the biggest pros uh, of AEC-based dosing is the ability uh, to get specific PK off the first dose, and you can make adjustments right away. You don't have to wait the steady state. Uh, general rule of thumb, if you don't trust the empiric equations or the patient is high risk of AKI, then get the levels right away. Don't wait the steady state. Um, one PK on one day one could look different than day three. You probably already know that because it could be accumulation. Bayesian, you can get levels whenever you want to because, again, it, uh, the program will adjust for that. Um, if you're going to roll a program out like this in your institution, like we did, um, everybody's got to be involved, pharmacists, again, uh, whoever's going to be dosing, 
has, we have to, you have to go through the background, the rationale for switching to AEC. Uh, I have to talk about the logistical approaches, mechanically, how you're going to do that, uh, calculator, Excel, online, EMR, Bayesian. Um, obviously, you have practice cases um, to, to show everyone how this is going to work. So education is really key. And you've got to have everybody involved. So phlebotomy, you've got to be aware you may be taking more than one level. Uh, prescribers have to be aware as well. Um, uh, laboratory certainly got to be as aware, aware of everything. So nursing, uh, phlebotomy, prescribers, laboratory, all have to be educated about this new program. So summary AUC-based dosing is coming. Uh, actually, it's here. Um, the math isn't that hard, but it's similar to what you've been doing all, all along. Uh, there are lots of different strategies to facilitate day-to-day -day dosing. Um, there's calculators, there's online calculators, there's homegrown. You can do an Excel sheet type calculator like we have done in the past. You can go to the Bayesian type program. And then education is really important for implementing uh, this at your institution if you're going to be successful. I think that should be all I have. I'll turn okay. it back over to Daisy. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ryback. Please um, stay on the line in case we have some questions in just a minute. Um, Stacy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Stacy is going to tell us how Premier is helping its members uh, meet this challenge with the change in the guidelines. Great. Thanks, Daisy. And thanks, thanks Dr. Ryback, for the very informative presentation. Um, I want to make sure we have time for questions, so I may cut my slides a little bit short here today. But I just want to start by saying my colleagues and I at Premier, we've had the opportunity to talk to many Premier members about the impact of shifting to AUC-based dosing for vancomycin and aminoglycosides. There's excitement about refining our approach to treating patients for such a commonly used medication as vancomycin based on the science and clinical evidence. And this represents a watershed moment where precision medicine is being introduced at scale for application in patient care. Next slide, Daisy. So with this, I just want to let you know that Premier has partnered with InsideRx to bring precision dosing into the clinical workflow. Its full integration into Theradoc provides a means to help over 1,100 members introduce the guidelines on day one. We are excited because this partnership stands to help our members achieve better outcomes through Bayesian modeling, lower costs by reducing the number of drug levels required to treat a patient, and it's incorporated directly into the Theradox clinical surveillance workflow. Next slide. This module introduces precision dosing not only for vancomycin, but also introduces precision dosing for aminoglycoside dosing and monitoring. This fully integrated module works helping pharmacy clinicians and infectious disease specialists predict expected expected concentrations and arrive at patient-specific dosing regimens using the Bayesian model. Essentially, it serves as a means to incorporate the AUC-based dosing into your clinical practice, offering multiple adult, pediatric, and neonate dosing models for vancomycin. And it also includes aminoglycoside models for those same patient populations. The integrated InsideRx module not only includes these dosing features, it also includes reporting and analysis features that track your time to therapeutic concentration, sample reduction, and rates of acute kidney injury in these populations. Next slide, please. At Premier, we're really excited about the coming changes and appreciate the hard work of Dr. Ryback and others to bring the science and clinical evidence of vancomycin to clinical, clinical practice. Listening to our members, we appreciate the desire and the challenges associated with adopting the new vancomycin guidelines. For those reasons, we have introduced a solution to help clinicians adopt the new vancomycin guidelines. For more information regarding Theradoc Insight RX module or how Premier can help you successfully adopt the guidelines, please contact us at the email on the screen, which is clinical solutions at premierinc.com. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Daisy for questions. Okay, um, great. Thank you, Stacy. 
Um, so we did have a couple of questions come through the chat window that I'm going to um, read out. The first one is for Dr. Ryback. For those of you on the phone, um, you are able to um, ask questions to the operator. Um, operator, they just need to press 1 on their phone, is that correct? Uh, actually, it is 1 followed by the 4 on their telephone, and they'll hear a three-tone prompt to acknowledge their request. Okay, so if you have any questions you'd like to put forward, please do that. Uh, I'm going to read off the first question that came through the chat window. So, Dr. Ryback, you mentioned at DNC that you're using the trapezoidal 2 post-dose level method. What are your considerations for switching to the Bayesian approach from an institutional point of view? What is my consideration for switching? Yeah, so um, um, we're assuming you're going to implement Bayesian at DMC. Is that correct, I believe? We are exploring that. Um, okay. Obviously, it's not a decision I can make for the Troy Medical Center. Okay. Uh, but it is being discussed as a uh, potential upgrade to what we're currently doing. Um, we do feel that um, the precision is there, and it allows us to use a uh, single trough level to do our monitoring uh, but still derive an AUC. And it's especially and particularly important to our pediatric population. We have the Children's Hospital of Michigan, and they're highly interested in, you know, drawing one level as opposed to drawing two levels from our sure. pediatric population. So we are very interested in exploring this and looking forward to Bayesian options. Uh, so uh, what about um, instituting it? I, I, I suppose if it's already part of a... EPIC or Premier system, it would be easier to do. I mean, there are uh, options for online um, access to these programs, so that might be a, an option as well to look at the different um, programs that are out there, but the, the easiest would be if it's already integrated because then you could just access it immediately. Our two-level calculator uh, requires us to back out of the EMR and go to an intranet do our calculations and then back back into the EMR to do our notes and uh, actual recommendations. So it would be great okay. if it was a one-stop shopping. Yeah, that does sound like that would be much easier. Um, so I did have another question uh, about the official guideline publication. Um, we didn't know if you would be able to give us, as one of the co-authors, any inside information on when those might be finalized. Well, there the that's a good question. So. They have been reviewed and re-reviewed by all of the organizations involved uh, in the guidelines. Uh, they have been blessed by the board of directors for each of those organizations. We all have, we have that blessing now, and it's uh, basically going through one more hoop, and I'm hoping to hear from ASHP because it's going to be published in AJHP. Um, I'm hoping to hear from them very soon. I'd like to see it published before the end of the year. The other thing is that we'd like to publish also in other sources, like an executive summary. So the, the main paper with all the nitty-gritty will be in AJHP, hopefully before the end of the year. And then I'd like to do executive summaries in uh, clinical infectious diseases, pharmacotherapy, and hopefully the Journal of Pediatric Infectious Diseases. Okay. Um, and then we also had a question. Um, it says, when collecting post-dose levels, are there concerns about collecting levels at least one half-life apart to ensure level accuracy? Yeah, there is some recommendations about separating the levels uh, post-dose infusion. So if you're using the two-level approach, you got to make sure that you're far enough away from the infusion because uh, most of you know that vancomycin is a two- to three-compartment drug, and, it's, and when we're applying one compartment pharmacokinetics, we have to make sure that we're actually in that one compartment and that's still in the alpha or beta phase. We've got to make sure we're not in the alpha phase during the infusion. So there is some talk of, about separating the levels far enough um, that um, you're going to more precisely be able to calculate the uh, elimination rate. So you can okay. take a look at that in the guidelines. And then one other question, it says, when do you need to recheck the level? So um, we may need a little clarification on that. I'm assuming they mean once you have, have AUC dose the first patient, do you need to do it again? Well, that's, all the, that, that's a clinical decision. So once you, have your, once you have your levels back and you're in a, uh, you have an AUC that's been derived from your levels, whether it's one or two, depending upon what approach, Bayesian or non-Bayesian, 
um, it's really if you made the, it made the target, then it depends on your patient's stability. If they're not changing renal function or volume, um, you're probably good to go. And how often do you check? I guess is how long is the patient on the therapy. So I would imagine a minimal once a week if someone's going to be on therapy for a long duration, but sooner if they're uh, are variable. In other words, if they're in the ICU, if they have changing renal function, changing volumes, uh, if their illness is getting worse, for example, you, you may need to check earlier. So a lot of that's kind of a clinical decision. Okay. And then I do have a question for Stacy. It says, does the clinical solution come with the Theradoc subscription, or is there an additional cost or contract needed? Uh, yes, it is an add-on subscription. So we do encourage you to reach out to the email that's on the screen uh, for further details on that, the clinical solutions at premierinc.com. Okay. And operator, are there any questions on the phone line? There are no phone questions at this time. Okay. Um, those are all of the written questions that I have. Does any, anyone else out there still have a question? Okay. If there's anything that we didn't cover today or if you have a question you think of later, even for Dr. Ryback, if you want to hit that clinical solutions at premierinc.com, we will make sure that it is forwarded on to him. Um, but otherwise, um, I want to thank both of our speakers for such an excellent presentation. <laughs>